Okay, we'll go ahead and get started on the profits. And we will be here for two to three weeks. And then we'll finish it up before the end of May, the What's in the Bible class. Uh, okay, so uh, when you're reading through the Bible, sometimes it can kind of seem, sometimes it can kind of seem like, okay, um, you had a good thing going, and now all of a sudden God has changed his means of communication and brought prophets onto the stage. Why? Why the sudden change? And I, I think that that's partly due to a modern misconception. See, prophets were a part of, were a part of the Bible's history the entire time, um, and it's a little bit misleading to call a certain group of the books the books of the prophets, uh, because especially in Jewish thought, uh, the prophets were there the whole time. You know, Abraham was said to be a prophet, Moses, Israel, Samuel, Elijah. All these people were said to be prophets, uh, though not in the same way that we would think of like Isaiah, still a prophet. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, it gives two different warnings about the prophets. And these aren't the only uh, warnings that the Bible has about prophets, but two very important ones nevertheless. The first warning is if a prophet says something and it comes true, but then they say, let's serve other gods. Meaning that you can have um, a false prophet that still gives a word that's right. And you can also have people who are not being used by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit who still work miracles that are not of God. Both those things can happen. There, it, there's this idea that there's no power in the demonic, and that's just not true. There is power in the demonic, and that's one of the things that I think confuses people. The second thing that Deuteronomy warns about is if there's a prophet that says something and it doesn't come true. It says, okay, that guy has spoken presumptuously. Don't listen to him. Uh, just kind of do away with him. Uh, and so those are two different things that, that the Bible clearly warns about with prophets. And there's really three, I would say, three aspects about the prophets. Um, and this is on the next slide there, uh, Darla. There's three warnings about the prophets. Uh, not three warnings. Um, three misconceptions about the prophets that I have to address. The first one is that the prophets were not hysterical babblers. There's this a very common modern conception of prophets where, like, they go into a trance and they're shaking and hooing and hawing. And bleh, that's not the biblical image that we see of the prophets. That's just not really a thing. The, se the second big misconception is we have, in our mind, we see prophets sometimes like this fortune tellers or people where you go to them and they read your palm or they tell you, you know, how, what, what house to buy or what car to buy. The biblical prophets very much so were not that. They were not fortune tellers for individuals. They were people proclaiming God's word, trying to bring people and God back in a proper relationship. And the third really misconception about the prophets is that they were religious fanatics. You have some people who are real big zealots nowadays, religiously speaking, and they want to be overly super spiritual. And so they want to be like the prof what they see the prophets being like and kind of with their nose in the air and, and being judgmental on everybody else. That's really not, really not the idea of what the prophets were at all. Um, Israel had gotten way far off base. They had a, pretty much abandoned their God entirely, although they still claimed him, and uh, lived however they wanted. The social injustice was just through the roof. Uh, immorality was rampant. This was just not a good spiritual atmosphere. And the prophets are addressing that. In fact, I would say that 90% of understanding the prophets of the Bible is understanding the context of the prophets of the Bible. If you understand what situation is being addressed, there is so much easier to grasp how it applies to you today. So um, another, another kind of idea that I want to warn about with the prophets is that the prophets didn't know the mind of God. Like there's this idea that if you get close enough to God and you're, uh, he uses you for, for prophetic words and stuff, that somehow you don't even have to go to God. You just know what God's will is on every single thing, and that's just not true. The prophets very much show God gave them specific words to give and then they gave those words and nothing else. They didn't invent it. They didn't go and just make something up. It was something they didn't say something unless God specifically said, say this. You know, and so that's something that we, nowadays in the charismatic movement, we really have to watch this. That we're not like, oh, um, I've been used in a, in, a gift of, in a gift of prophecy. Therefore, I am a prophet who knows the mind of God. And it's like, no, 
no, you can't make yourself on equal ground uh, with God. They gave the word of God, and they had their own flaws as prophets and as people, uh, but they were still very much so devoted to God, even though they were struggling. And you see this um, in some prophets over others. Like, for instance, um, Jeremiah, we see him as a prophet very much so who struggles. Um, it, the book records him um, kind of losing faith at one point. It records him lying. It records him um, doing some things that really aren't the best. And, and this is this is the prophet Jeremiah, you know. And, and it, he's called the weeping prophet because he's going off, you know, disappointed about all these things, depressed about the situation that he's in. Or you take Elijah the prophet, uh, who apparently, at least for a point, struggled with mental health and depression. Um, you know, these are these are big flaws uh, in, in, in God's uh, voice. Or when you look at Habakkuk, where he says, hey, God, how could you possibly let this happen? And God says, well, I, you know, it's actually going to get worse than this. And he's like, wait, hold on. <laughs> you can't let that happen. So prophets are very much so real people who are devoted to God, but they do struggle. Um, they were, their, their ministry really had twofold. They were forth tellers and foretellers. So the difference is that they proclaimed the message of God, that's forth telling, but they also, uh, God would tell, would say what things were going to happen in the future with Israel, which is the foretelling part. Um, <coughs> they did use many different ways of giving the message of God, though, the very creative ways. Sometimes they would write a song, sometimes they would use like imagery or different um, kind of allegorical things. Um, there was one part where um, one of the prophets has a yoke on him. You know, different ways of saying the message of God in just a real creative way. Um, and, and, you, and you definitely see their, their artistic capabilities throughout the books. Now, the biblical prophets are very unique to the prophets of the pagan world in at least four aspects. First off, um, their prophecy was to the whole nation, not just the rulers. The pagan prophets tended to focus more only on the rulers. Uh, the second big unique factor is that um, in the biblical prophets always emphasize attitude over ritual. And this is very unique. Um, I already mentioned about how it was unique in the law, you know, the whole attitude and um, how you treat people trumping the ritual part of it. But it's also still very much so a, a part of the prophets um, where attitudes were, were more important than the rituals. The third way that the prophets were unique is that um, there was a required morality to what the prophets had to say. Um, in other words, it, it mattered how Israel acted. It mattered how they, um, how they conducted themselves, the lifestyle that they, that they lived, the way that they um, interacted with other Israelites, the way that they, you know, all these different moral issues. It mattered if you were sleeping around and you were trying to get close to God. That mattered. It wasn't something that God would brush it under the rug. It was something that was very important to God, and still is, obviously. And then the fourth way that the biblical prophets are very much so unique from the pagan prophets is that whereas the pagan prophets had a way of really only looking at the immediate um, realities, the biblical prophets had a way of pointing towards the future and, and the consequences of what was after the immediate and uh, that was very, very uh, singular about them. Uh, in fact, if you read King, the book of First and Second Kings, it's basically a prophetic uh, analysis of history. He, Kings, First and Second Kings is a book of prophets, really, is what it is. If you, as you read through, there's a lot of prophets that are highlighted, a lot of messages from the prophets that are highlighted, and it keeps drawing them back to the idea of the covenant and whether or not Israel is fulfilling that covenant and how it applies to them. Very, very much so uh, connected. Uh, another thing that I personally find irritating about the prophets is that not all the prophecies were recorded. I'm a completionist. I like to think in my head that all the prophets recorded their words and then they were all preserved to today, but that's just not true. There's a lot of prophets that either they didn't have a book, um, you know, or, or maybe not all of their prophecies were recorded. Um, a lot of different things like that. Like, for instance, Jonah is a good example of that. It doesn't seem like, it seems like Jonah had a lot of prophecies that just were not really even mentioned. He's mentioned as a person in the book of Kings, and then he's mentioned in the book of Jonah as going to the Ninevites. But the only word of prophecy you really hear from Nineveh is he says, but 40 days in Nineveh will be destroyed. That's really the only prophecy we have from this character. Um, so not all the prophecies are recorded, which once again I find very 
frustrating. I, I, I wish, but eh, if wishes were horses, right? Uh, the ones that are recorded, though, uh, they were recorded in three basic means. The first off, uh, oftentimes the prophet re- would record their prophecies himself. Or, second way, they had scribes. For instance, um, I think it's J- Jeremiah that had his uh, scribe Baruch. Uh, or there, another, a third um, thing that happened is certain prophets would have so much, somewhat of a school or uh, disciples, kind of think more like that. And the disciples would be responsible for preserving the prophets' uh, written prophecies and, and copying them and stuff like that. Um, so some common themes throughout really all the prophets, uh, the covenant. This is a huge theme um, throughout it because it was kind of like the uniting factor of, uh, of Israelite, uh, being an Israelite. It was basically their constitution. And they would always bring back the idea of you are in a covenant relationship with God. He, the covenant was, was stipulated to you in, like, for instance, the book of Deuteronomy, and you are breaking that, and this is a, a transgression not just against your man, but you are actually in opposition to God right now. And so that was basically the, the main emphasis of, of the prophets. So some parts that you read in the, the books of the prophets are not going to be directly applicable to your life today. Now, I'm not saying that it's not God's word. It is God's word, okay? And absolutely all of it is inspired by God. But with the books of prophets, there's going to be a little bit more legwork you have to do. You can't just open it and read it and it applies to me. You have to realize that there's a big gulf between you and them. They had a covenant with God. We do not have that same covenant with God. So when you're reading it, you kind of have to, okay, what has changed and what's still the same? And then after you've done the legwork, then apply it to your life. So it's not that it doesn't apply to us. It's just that we have to do a little bit more um, study to do it. Um, the, the, w- inherent in the idea of the covenant with God w- were the ideas like returning to God and being at peace uh, with God and these kinds of different things. But there was also two more. Um, mm, no, we're just going to mention one more uh, major thing that you see really throughout the prophets is the idea of the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord isn't always the end times. The day of the Lord is a, is a significant uh, time. It's usually not a singular day. It's usually a period. It's called the day singular of the Lord, but it's not really ever talking about a single day. It's usually talking about a span of time. Um, so one of the days of the Lord was when Assyria came through and conquered Israel. Another day of the Lord was when Babylon conquered uh, Judah and destroyed Jerusalem. These were days of the Lord. Um, there's, there was um, another day of the Lord that happened uh, afterwards. There was a, a future day of the Lord that's coming. There's also been some other days of the Lord when significant events have happened. Uh, but the idea that I'm getting across here is that um, the day of the Lord is a very big idea to the prophets. And just because you read it in the prophet and it says the day of the Lord is coming does not mean that at this point in history it has not already come. Okay, Because it's not always talking about um, the rapture and that stuff. Uh, one thing that's very important to notice about whenever they're talking about the day of the Lord is it oftentimes isn't just judgment on sinners, those people up there. But it's actually a lot of the time it's judgment on God's people, God's house as well. Uh, and I think it's Peter that even talks about judgment has to always begin in the house of God. Uh, I want to say that's First Peter, but don't quote me on that. Um, and, and so especially in, in some of the prophets, we're going to look at Amos here in just a minute. Amos was going on, and they were talking about God's judgment on the different nations, and Israel was super excited, right? But then at the end of that, Amos kind of switches gears, and he says, yeah, and God's judgment is also coming on you. And now they're like, okay, hold on. Get out of Israel. Get out of here. You, when, you can't speak against God's people like that. And uh, it became a huge point of contention between Amos and, uh, and the audience. There is a little bit of, a, of something that we miss in English that I think is important to bring up, and that's the idea of the anointed one, also called the Messiah or the Christ, because there is a singular figure, the anointed one, which is Christ, but then there's also historical anointed ones or Christs. And let me kind of get, a, get across what I'm trying to say, okay? There's only one Jesus, only one that can save us from sin. That's Jesus the Christ, okay? But then the Old Testament oftentimes uses the idea of an anointed one or a Christ type that um, is anointed by God to do a task. So some examples of these would be uh, kings were oftentimes called uh, God's anointed. Um, Prophets were also oftentimes called. So if you're going along in the Hebrew, it's going to be the same word. 
the same word Messiah. It's going to be the exact same word. Uh, and it can be a little bit confusing. And the idea here is you really have to pay attention to the context, whether it's talking about the Christ or a Christ. The anointed one, the only one who can bring salvation from sin, or an anointed one that God has appointed for a task. I mean, with that being said, you could even see, say that pastors are anointed ones. You know, it, it, there is very much so in the Bible a difference between the anointed ones and the anointed one. So, you know, just bring that out there. So if you're reading it and, and you, somebody tries to say about how we're all Christ's, that's not what it means at all. It's just um, more of a word having different meanings in different contexts. Um, we are not little Christ's, just so that we're all clear. Uh, most of the prophecies of the Old Testament, well, I, most of the prophecies in the Bible have already come to pass. Uh, there's a few that have not. Um, like if one of the biggest uh, things that I think of, and we'll get to this later, is the prophet Ezekiel, who prophesied that there was going to be a new temple that was built, and it was going to be super awesome, and that temple was never built. Um, and now we're at a part of human history where sacrifices are n- no longer accepted by God, but yet Ezekiel says that there's going to be sacrifices done at that, pr- at that temple. What does that mean for us today? So obviously there's things like that that, that, that you know are, are kind of big points of prophecy that just can't be brushed off. They should be wrestled with. Um, and, but for the most part, all the, the prophecies that you're going to read in the prophets have already come to pass. Now, there's three important time frames to keep in mind. The Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, and the Persian Empire. Now, technically speaking, the Babylonian Empire that is relevant to the Bible is called the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And the reason for that is because there was what was called the Old Babylonian Empire, and that was way back in like the 1700s B.C. with like, you know, Hammurabi and, and all those guys, okay? Uh, but it, 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 it kind of fell and it became a new superpower after, after the Syrians fell. Uh, well, I guess I should say towards the end of the Syrians because Babylon was the one who conquered Assyria. So if you keep these dates in mind, it, it's really helpful. The Syrians, for the most part, you could say were from 315, 1356-ish, to about 609. They, they finally went bit the bullet in 609. Um, that's not overly accurate because it consisted of two different stages of their um, empire. Um, the, the, the Assyrian Empire that you read about in the Bible is from the 900s to the 600s. But you could just simplify history and say it was into the 1350s to the 600s. And the reason for that is because when Assyria was a, a, a first got, became a power... You have to understand that Egypt at that time was also a superpower, and Israel was coming out from Egypt, going into the, into the wilderness, and the global stage was kind of off in the distance. For Israel, it, didn't really matter. it wasn't really affecting them. And uh, so then they go <coughs> to uh, the land of Canaan, which is pretty much a fragmented country. And so there's these superpowers around them, but once again, they don't really come into play. And then you get in the book of Judges, and Philistia, the Philistines, are kind of a big thing. But they're not a superpower. They're just a big kingdom in Canaan. Uh, And it kind of goes like that with, like, the warring kingdoms. And it doesn't really have much effect on Israel, by and large, until you get to, once again, about the time of, uh, of the kings, uh, you know, in the first kings, so uh, Assyria becomes kind of more of a more of an important feature, and it kind of gets more and more scary. Well, then you get into like the 700s, and things are really looking tense. Uh, it's basically what's happening right now with how things are real tense with Russia and China and Korea. It, basically, the same thing was happening for them in the 700s. Like, hey, there are some very tense things happening all around us. Not a good time to be alive. Uh, and uh, so then the Assyrians finally fell in 609. The Babylonians had been gaining steam since about 626, uh, and it just took them about 20 years or so to beat them. Uh, but the Babylonian, the Neo-Babylonian Empire really didn't last that long. Uh, it fell in 539 to the Persians, of all people. Uh, why I say that is because Persia didn't seem like they were going to be the next superpower. They were more like... Um, not to make this too simple, but they were basically like a series of tribes and with the, with the Medes and the Persians and all that. And then they became a united front, and it's it just really weird how that played out. And then they, of all people, came down and conquered the Babylonians, which is just a, a huge, like, odd ball out. And uh, so, okay, uh, this uh, understanding those three... Those three superpowers is very important for understanding 
um, the prophets, because if you don't understand what's happening there, you're not going to get what the prophets are saying. So let's go through a couple of the prophets. The first one is Jonah. It's on the, yeah. Uh, Jonah was a prophet sent from Israel in the, nor- in the north to Assyria. And he's also the earliest of the uh, prophets that have their own prophet book. Okay, so obviously, once again, it's not the first prophet. It's the first of the, the books of the prophets. He, he came first. So eh, I'm saying that confusing, but you get what I'm saying. Um, so who was in power at that point? Assyria was in power. Obviously not friends of the um, Israelites, and things kind of were a little bit tense anyways. So then God tells him to go to the Assyrians, and it's like, whoa, hold on. Are you sure about that? Uh, and so he, brought, he went around the 770s, somewhere around there. Um, and it's important to note that these people who conquered, they conquered because God rose them to power. And this is going to be extremely important because God says that he had great punishment for the Babylonians, which brings a very interesting question. How on earth could God raise up a people and then punish them for what he raised them up for? Well, there, there's, a, there's a few things that need to be said. First off, the Babylonians were called by God to bring punishment on Israel, but... They went farther than God told them to go, and they brought more destruction and death than God actually intended for them to do. They stepped outside of his will. The second thing is the Babylonians did not honor God, nor did they serve God. So when God used them as basically, not to, not to sound too flippant, but like a plaything, and he used them and discarded them, it, he was using them for his own purposes is what I'm trying to get across. And um, they were living in sin, and they were enemies of God, So, I mean, they were already headed towards um, their own way and not interested in what God had to say. So it was just God using something that, for his own purposes, that that was trying to be used for for their own purposes. And God oftentimes does this with us when we're in sin. We try to go on our own way, and little do we realize that God the whole time is still in control just because we're going our own way doesn't mean that God's not in control. So... Um, it, Babylon was held to a harsher judgment. Back to Assyria, though, um, God's mercy is really shown in the book of Jonah. Um, you have a lot of really big inf- big points. And the first, obviously, is God's mercy. Um, this is a huge point of Jonah, which really sheds a lot of light on the prophets as a whole. In fact, in, uh, later in the book of Ezekiel, he's going to say something that, that very much so applies to the, to the book of Jonah. He says, I, I have no pleasure in the, the death or the destruction of the wicked. And you see that very much so in Jonah. He's not waiting with bated breath to bring destruction and, and, and to kill and all that. He's not waiting for that. He's waiting for people to return to him, to come to him. And uh, so another big thing you see in the book of Jonah that, that's a huge, a huge thing that I feel like is oftentimes just kind of dismissed is bias and racism. The idea that God's grace couldn't possibly go to the people group that I don't like. A huge issue in the book of Jonah, um, especially when you consider how immoral the serial was and how they were the enemies of God's people, and yet God still wanted to save them. So really big ideas there. Um, another idea uh, in Jonah that I think is really interesting, it's almost si- almost singular, not quite, but almost, um, the idea of running from God and not wanting to be in God's will, and yet God's still showing you mercy even though you messed up and even though you left what he wanted, um, and you didn't want to do what God said. As far as when was this as far as the kings? So... One of the last kings of Israel, he wasn't the last one, but he was one of the last ones. Uh, he reigned 40-some some, some years. His name was Jeroboam II. In the Bible, you're usually going to come into him as just Jeroboam. And when you're reading in the books of Kings, uh, I believe singing Kings, you're going to run into him, and this is who that person is. This was around the time frame that um, Jonah was going to Nineveh. Uh, it, he, Jonah is also mentioned in the book of Kings, you're going to, when you're reading through Kings this year, uh, make sure to keep your eyes open and see when you, when you see Jonah mentioned, because he just mentioned in passing. Uh, Jonah does give us a very strong basis for evangelism that is something that's going to be returned to in the New Testament, and that's the idea of how can they possibly turn if they don't hear the message. Uh, a lot of times nowadays, the, the idea of evangelism is kind of offensive, right? So, you can't push your culture onto other people. That's a big thing nowadays. Uh, another thing is, how could God possibly punish people 
uh, who never had a chance to hear, you know, big questions like that. I'm not saying they're not important questions. I'm not saying that. But I feel like sometimes um, people like to come up with um, arguments against God and to kind of justify their bad attitude towards God. And I feel like a lot of times you're never going to get all those answers, questions answered. Maybe it'd be a better option to try and listen and learn. Maybe that's my own personal bias. But uh, either way, Jonah has a huge basis for evangelism. And one of the foundational, once again, the, one of the foundational teachings of Jonah is the idea of mercy, which is contrasted throughout the book because God's trying to show mercy while Jonah is continu- continually trying to withhold mercy. So you have God and Jonah being arch, not, uh, maybe this is the wrong term to use, but kind of like archetypes. So you have God being the um, ultimate good and Jonah being, in the story at least, the ultimate bad because he's trying to s- prevent people from coming to salvation while God is at the same time trying to bring people to salvation. And you see God's mercy shown towards Jonah and how it's also going to, to Nineveh and uh, the kind of idea that, well, who is deserving of God's mercy? Well, neither. Well, who was deserving of God's wrath? Well, both. And this is a big point, once again, because remember, in the Jewish mindset, Jews are first, Jews deserve salvation. So this is a huge, huge um, uh, contradiction to that. Uh, there are a couple issues that are brought up with the book of Jonah that I don't want to spend too long on, but I just need to address. The first is, what kind of fish was it? It's not really the main point, nor is it really that relevant. <laughs> uh, we don't know. It was a large fish of some sort, so it, it could have been a well. Yes, that's possible. It could have been a fish. That is possible. Um, but one thing we do know is it did not look like on Pinocchio, where there was like all kinds of space in there and a boat, and he's just sitting there smoking a cigar. No, it was not like that. Whatever it was, it was largely uncomfortable, uh, and that's pretty much all we know. Uh, how on earth was he preserved from dying in, in underwater? I have no idea. Maybe the fish was swimming on the top of the water? I don't know. But what I do know is that this is not the biggest miracle that God did. The, the bigger thing that God did was he created everything from nothing. That is the bigger miracle. So if we can, if we can accept that God created everything from nothing, life from non-life, brought complete order, even to the point that there are laws of the universe, then I think that it might not be as big to say that he preserved Jonah in, in, a, in a fish's belly. You know, it just, it's just not as big of a deal um, as that. So I, I feel like sometimes people make big deals out of nothing, like, oh, miracles don't really happen. It's like, well, hold on, hold on. Who said, who on earth said that salvation was less of a miracle than somebody's arm being healed? Like, who said that? Hey, that doesn't make sense at all. But anyways, um, I guess it's because we, we more like the, the physical things that we can see. Uh, the last issue that I want to bring up in Jonah that's oftentimes brought up is it says that it took Jonah three days of walking through Nineveh but Nineveh was just not that large. It would not have taken him more than a day. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of obvious solutions to this, so I'll throw out a couple of them, and, and you can take it as you wish. The first is that he was walking around the metroplex, so not just Nineveh, but also the surrounding cities, uh, which could be an option. My personal opinion is this last one here. Um, he was going throughout the streets instead of directly around. So he was like walking throughout Nineveh, and it took him three days doing that, which I find that to be very likely, um, just from the idea of it. But I I could be wrong. It it makes a lot of sense, though, and it would resolve the issue where there isn't a contradiction. Uh, So as far as outlines for the prophetic books, we're really not going to get into outlines. I'm just going to give you basic ideas of them because a lot of them don't really have outlines. Um, I mean, Isaiah kind of has an outline with it having two halves, sort of, but not really. Um, the smaller prophetic books don't really have outlines so much as they have like a main central theme that they're talking about. So for the sake of simplicity, um, Jonah, the outline of Jonah is basically God calls, Jonah runs, eventually goes, and the pagans believe while the prophet becomes more and more bitter. <laughs> and I mean, that's the basic outline, but like I say, it, it really is a story about running from God and, and mercy and redemption. Um, yeah. Let's see.
Okay, so, so what? What does it matter that Jonah is in our Bible? What does it matter that we read it? Well, I think, and there's a lot of things, once again, that could be said for all these books, but I think the, really the biggest thing I want to say is God wants to save everyone. And I think that's extremely important because Jonah is the only prophetic book where God says, go to these people, and he says, no, I'm not doing that. And then he runs away in the opposite direction. Like, it's the only one of the prophetic books where that happens. So then the second uh, book, the the next prophet in order of their prophecy, and I'm trying to keep it that way so you can kind of see the historical setting, is Amos. Now, Amos was a prophet that was sent from Judah to Israel. Um, And it's interesting because Israel actually received the least amount of prophets and the least amount of time to turn. Um, And uh, why is that? Well, I think there's a lot of different reasons for that, but... I think one thing is that Israel had zero righteous kings and Judah had some righteous kings. I think that might have had something to do with it. Um, another thing is because Israel was like hell-bent on doing really big sins and Judah took some time to catch the same steam that Israel had. Um, so who was in power at the time? Once again, the Syrians. Amos prophesied sometime around 760. The main theme of Amos is basically God's judgment on Israel, who was no better than the other nations. A uh, very big point because, once again, Israel thought that they were untouchable. Um, he prophesied, once again, the same kind of idea as, the, as Jonah. Prophesied during the reigns of Jer- Jeroboam II of Israel and Uzziah, also called Azariah, of Judah. Um, this is a very interesting time, and it applies to Amos and the next one we're going to look at, who is um, Hosea, um, and partly on Isaiah too. Uh, and that's this. There was huge economic success at this time. Israel and Judah both gained a bunch of territory. They, uh, so uh, Kingdom-wise, politically speaking, they were doing fantastic. Their economy was thriving. Everything seemed great, but the religious atmosphere was just dead. And so Israel, and actually partly Judah too, had, had a very false confidence. Like, okay, we're doing good. We can make it our own. We don't really need God. And obviously they were wrong. <laughs> uh, as far as Amos himself, he addresses social injustice quite a bit. In fact, a lot of the prophets talk about social injustice um, I, not not to the point that we should say that they were social justice warriors like the people nowadays who sit in the highway while cars have to stop traffic. Not like that. Not like that. Uh, very much so not social justice warriors because it wasn't the point of social justice for itself. It was because by doing injustice, they were breaking covenant with God. And so the, the focus of the injustice was God not how things, quote-unquote, should be by what I decide. So huge differences there. Um, <clears throat> but the people did not want to listen when he, was, when, we were, when he was prophesying. They had this kind of idea, we are God's people, how dare you talk against us? And it becomes a huge point of contention between the rulers of Israel and Amos. Uh, they wanted God's, God's judgment, absolutely, but they didn't realize that it would come first on them who were more wicked than the sinners that they wanted God to punish, uh, which I think is usually the, usually the point, uh, or usually the case. Oftentimes when we are living in sin, we want God's judgment on everybody else, but not on us. And you see this over and over again, I'm going to get stuck in sin, and then I'm going to get upset with everybody else. And it's like, well... The correct attitude isn't pride, but rather humility. God, please have mercy on me, a sinner. And he, they just didn't, didn't get that. Um, and I think that it's no coincidence that this is towards the end of their life, before Israel is destroyed, right before Israel is destroyed. And when you get to that point of pride, there's really not too many places left you can go. Um, Amos is, is really an interesting book. It has a series of averted disasters. So um, there's three different things that God says is going to come on them. The first one, God says, I'm going to do this. And, and Amos intercedes and says, please, God, don't do this. And so he turns and he says, okay, that's not going to happen. Then the second thing, I think it's um, that the sun's going to, or the, the heat's going to just like wither everything or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Um, but he, he says that this is going to happen. And Amos goes to God again and intercedes. Please don't let this happen, God. And he takes back that judgment as well. Uh, and then the third thing he says is going to happen, he, he brings a, um, um, basically a measuring rod and finds them crooked, that they're not straight, they're not um, taking, they're not uh, living by a good standard. And uh, so then he talks, there's two more prophecies that basically just talk about the way the judgment is coming 
coming soon, and there's not much that they can do about it. Um, but now this is this is a contradiction in the Bible that is an intentional contradiction. It's something God intended as a contradiction. Throughout, you see this in Lamentations, you see it in Amos, you see it throughout the prophets. God is the one who's bringing judgment to destroy. To be saved from this, they have to turn to the one who is actively destroying them. It's a huge theme. You read about it all throughout the book of Lamentations. You read it all throughout the, bo- all, all throughout the books of the prophets. It's an intentional contradiction. It's not something that's on accident. God very much was trying to get a very important point across. So, uh, as far as so what, what does it matter that Amos is, is, in, our, is in our Bible? What does it matter that we read it? Um, it, it, it Amos like the law did, but uniquely, it talks about how we treat others revealing our spiritual state. If you want to see what kind of terms you are on with God, look at how you're treating other people, and that really uh, sheds the light. Um, so let's go through just a couple more. Uh, Hosea. Uh, Hosea was a prophet from Israel, if I remember correctly, although I forgot to double-check that. Um, I'm not, that. That actually, I'm not sure where Hosea was from, so... Uh, I'm not sure where he's from. But either way, he was sent to Israel. Um, and as far as, once again, who was in power? Still the Assyrians. Um, all the prophets we're looking at today, was, was, was Assyria was in power. He prophesied from the time about 760 to 730 in there. Once again, Jeroboam the second was the king in Israel. Uh, and remember that Israel fell and was conquered in 722. So uh, that kind of gives you a good time from there. Whereas Judah didn't fall until 586. Hosea uses a lot of imagery uh, of an unfaithful wife, uh, which is obviously a uh, representation of Israel, God's wife, who is committing adultery by going to the other gods. Um, Obviously, uh, the prophet Hosea would not pass today's standard of God's will, because how could God possibly have it in in his will to have you in a relationship with someone who was obviously not as spiritual as you? (laughs) That's sarcasm. Uh, yes, it is oftentimes God's will that we stay in bad situations, and he teaches us very important things and uses it as a, a witness to other people. Obviously, not every single situation, and I'm not saying you should like stay in an abusive relationship or anything, but uh, there is that idea that um, in our culture that if it's a toxic situation, God couldn't possibly want it for you, and that's just not always true. Um, Jose's children are named prophetically. Uh, for what was being prophesied. So one of his kids was named Not Loved uh, in the way that God would not love Israel. He would kind of spurn them. Uh, another one was named Not My People because he was discarding Israel. Uh, and remember, it's not Israel who threw Israel, I mean, God who threw Israel away. It's Israel who threw God away. Big difference there. Um, it, Hosea is oftentimes quoted in the New Testament. Uh, for instance, in the book of Matthew, it says, Out of Egypt I called my son. That's a quote from Hosea. Or when it says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, that is also from Hosea. Um, Romans chapter 9 also quotes Hosea. So it's, so it's quoted quite a bit in the New Testament. So what, what does it matter that, that we read Hosea? Well, one of the big things about Hosea, I think, that really gets across is that God is faith, faithful past our unfaithfulness, which is really a, a timeless lesson, especially when you compare um, your faithlessness you being the prostitute in the situation, with God's faithfulness, God being Hosea in the place of Hosea, I mean. And it really kind of brings to light um, God's mercy. Uh, next up is Isaiah. Um, obviously, now here's the, here's the bad news, guys. We don't have enough time to break down the bigger prophetic books in real in-depth, which I wish we did, but we just don't. It's not possible. Um, so we're going to have to talk about Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel and Ezekiel in smaller pieces, just like the other prophets. So Isaiah is kind of to Judah, but he's also kind of to the nations, and he's also kind of to Israel. It's complicated. Uh, Isaiah, once again, because it's such a big book, there's prophecies to all kinds of different people. Uh, He prophesied about 740 to 700, but that's not, like, rigid. Um, Assyria was was under control. He, he, his prophecies go through the time of the northern kingdom of Israel being destroyed. There's numerous themes throughout the book, but the ones that I think we could draw the most attention to are, first off, the idea of the suffering servant. It's a huge theme in the book of Isaiah, oh, uh, the coming Messiah, the, that whole, it's kind of like a package deal in Isaiah, a huge major theme. Another idea is, that, is God's sovereignty. 
that he's ultimately behind everything, not behind everything like uh, making people sin, but uh, in control of things even when it seems like he's not. Uh, and also an- the last of the three major themes of Isaiah is the idea of the remnant of Israel. It repeats itself over throughout Isaiah, the idea that there will be a remnant of Israel, a remnant of, like over and over again. Uh, as, as you go through, you'll, you'll kind of see that, though. Um, it, Isaiah's uh, sons were also named for prophetic reasons. One's called Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. The other one is, um, I don't remember what the other one was called, because uh, mostly I, I, it took me so much to remember Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. <laughs> uh, but uh, so the idea that God, Isaiah named his two sons uh, according to God's promises so that when, when all the things had been fulfilled, it was a way to point forward to God's um, coming uh, renewal of the people of Israel. <laughs> Isaiah can kind of be broken down into two sections. The first half of, uh, of Isaiah is more of judgment. It goes through 1 through like 39-ish. Uh, and then the second half is more hopeful. It goes to like 40 to 66. Uh, the first half focuses more on Assyria. The second half focuses more on Babylon. Uh, once again, though, these are just... Maybe there's better ways of breaking it up. Uh, one of the big things that you see in the book of Isaiah is that people would, he, he talks about the way that people would call good evil. And you see that nowadays, not just in the world, but in the church too, which I think is very unfortunate. Uh, and a lot of times names are attached to things that make it sound better. So like some modern day examples of this, pro-choice, it sounds good that way. Because it sounds like, oh, you want people to be able to have choice and to have freedom and to live their life and, and be happy pro-choice. It doesn't sound bad like that. Um, and even to the point that a couple of years ago, they were doing this whole social media thing where it was like um, rejoicing about your abortion. It was like, shout out your abortion. And so people were having abortions and then posting it with the hashtag online. And, you know, kind of like that. And I think that's a good example of calling good evil. Um, another thing that you hear people say, oh, he became a man. What they mean to say, he lost his virginity. That didn't make him a man. It made him immoral. That's it. Um, another thing, finding your true self. They talk about this like it's a good thing, but what it amounts to is you have people who are mentally confused, and because they're mentally confused, they're cutting parts of their body off. That's not good. That's bad. Any other thing, if I said, yeah, I'm cutting off parts of my body, and I think that I'm something that I'm not, any other, any other thing except for transgenderism, we would say, Get this person to the to to a doctor. They they need help. We wouldn't make fun of them. We wouldn't you know go along with their ideas. We'd say no. You need help, and I I'm here to help you. Well, let's get you on medication or whatever we have to do to fix this. Uh, but for whatever reason, with transgenders and people go to weird places. They either say we have to love them by accepting their confusion, or we have to make fun of them and just you know ma- treat them like they're idiots. And it's like hold on. If somebody is mentally confused enough to cut off parts of their body, I think that ridiculing them is probably not a good option. I mean, there's there's got to be something else we could do, you know. And I don't see God making fun of. of I don't. I think God hurts for people who are hurting. And I think that you know, obviously, if you're willing to cut off parts of your body, you're hurting. Um, so these are some things that are called. And that's that's even in the church. This is a bad thing that we're calling good. Hey, because I don't agree with with transgenderism. Let's ridicule them. Let's, you know, and th- that's not a good thing. And, and it's very important to learn that message because calling good evil doesn't, calling evil good doesn't make it good. It just makes our definition wrong. Um, so, okay, um, intolerant. That People throw this around all the time talking about the church. The church is intolerant. And what they mean to say is we have standards and beliefs, which keep in mind that everybody has standards and beliefs. So if I'm an advocate for human rights, then that's my standard and belief. If I'm an advocate for transgenders, that, that's my standard and belief. And I'm going to advocate for them, which means I'm going to impress my view on you about it. See what I mean? It's, 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 you can't get away from it. The only difference is what are you calling good and what are you calling evil? And if it's by your own standard of what you feel at the time, that's not really good or evil. It's just what you think. So did Isaiah's wife have an immaculate conception? This is brought up quite a bit because it says there's going to be a sign the virgin will give birth. So, is Isaiah's wife, is, did she have a, did she get pregnant without, without sex? And I think there's two things. First off, no. She was a virgin at the time of the prophecy, 
But later, she would go, Isaiah was prophesying that she would get pregnant and have a child, and that would be a sign. And then the second way that that prophecy was, was fulfilled was that Jesus' birth was the fulfillment ultimately to that prophecy. Um, and both, both those things are, you don't have to, once again, you don't have to make stuff up. Um, in fact, the, the, the two hacks, halves of Isaiah are so different that a lot of scholars have, have thought that there are two or three different people who wrote the book. Because the first half is so different than the second half, and to that it, it seems it seems too like we're making it too complicated. If I write a book, can I write another book that is completely different in content? Yes, we do it in college all the time, right? So why do we have to say that Isaiah was written by two different people? It's just silly. Uh, a lot of details in the book of Isaiah are given long before they ever came about. So you remember that Assyria didn't fall until six o nine. And yet you remember that, Isa- that Isaiah's prophecy is from 740 to 700. And yet Isaiah prophesies Babylon's rise to power as well as Babylon's coming judgment before they were even a power on the stage. Amazing. And then uh, Isaiah calls Cyrus out by name who wasn't a po- Remember, Assyria is the one in power. Cyrus wasn't the king of Babylon, the next coming empire. He was the, uh, the, one of the leaders of the next empire after that empire, the Persians. So as Isaiah is giving details about things that wouldn't happen. We're not talking about for 10 or 20 years. We're talking about two world powers later. This is the big, important stuff. And obviously you could try to diminish this by saying, well, somebody came later and added the name in anyways. Let's go along with that. Let's say... You're right. There's some gremlin that added the name, of, the name of Cyrus later. Isaiah still got the idea that there was another ruler that was coming who God knew by name that was going to conquer Babylon before Babylon was even a power. I mean, even if you try and diminish it, you still have to answer that really amazing prophecy. It's like the prophecies of Jesus. He fulfilled so many prophecies just by being born. Things that were outside of his control, like how on the earth? Anyways, uh, history in the book of Isaiah and in some of the other prophets are recorded as prophetic. The history itself is prophetic. So when you're reading through Isaiah, you'll notice that like halfway through the book, it kind of switches gears and it stops giving prophecy and it starts giving like a history book. That's part of the prophecy as well. So just pay attention to how it connects to the prophecies and, and you'll kind of see it there. Um, let's see what else to say about this. Um, so there's not much basis for the idea that two different people wrote the book of Isaiah. It's just not really there, so I don't, I'm not going to waste too much time talking about it. So what? what is the matter that we have Isaiah? Well, Isaiah is really one of those prophets that I think if you had lost all the prophets and you could only have one, Isaiah would probably be the one that God would, you know, have us keep. You know, if, if, if all the other ones were going to get lost, you know, like we were living in some tribal place and only one, one prophet could come and find its way to us, it would probably be the book of Isaiah. It has so much in it that is really a bridge between the law and the gospel. Um, I mean, the first half, we're talking about the judgment that is due. And then the second half, talking about the forgiveness and mercy that's coming. It, it's basically, Isaiah is basically a bridge between the law and the gospel. It's, it's really amazing like that. Uh, Isaiah is ultimately about comfort, even in the midst of great suffering. And that's just a really phenomenal message. And the last book we're going to look at um, is Micah. <coughs> uh, and, and, and Micah is a prophet that was from Judah uh, to Judah and Israel. Uh, he prophesied about 737 to 690, which makes him the last prophet uh, from the time of the Syrians. The main theme is social injustice and true worship. Uh, it's in the book of Micah, for instance, that it says to love mercy, do justly, and walk humbly, which is interesting because we typically don't get that balance right. We're supposed to do justice, but how on earth can we do justice uh, if we're supposed to show mercy? Well, Micah talks about that. Love mercy, but still do justice and walk humbly with God. So, very interesting book. Uh, we're not going to say much about it. Um, like I said, with these smaller prophetic books, you kind of you, you can't go too in depth on them without having a class about that book. So what? What does it matter that we have Micah? Well, Micah really gets across the idea of God's punishment is met with God's mercy. 
A lot, a lot of times, even in the church world, we get a little bit off basis where it's one or the other. But in Micah, you, you see this, this, this idea where you see God's judgment, yes, but you see God's mercy really forefront, and it really just meets so perfectly in the book. So any questions about anything we looked at tonight? Okay. Um, next week, we'll get into the prophets that prophesied during the time of the Babylonians. So, uh, and there's going to be a little bit of overlap, though. Some of the prophets prophesied, started prophesying while Assyria was te- technically still in power, so just keep that in mind. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, help us to, uh, to treasure it and to learn from it and to always be studying it. Uh, we love you, Lord. Amen.